Well, I'm delighted to welcome tonight's guest, and it is Naomi, well known to us all in Ararat, well loved in Ararat, and uh, I've asked Naomi to come along and tell us about her life, her international life, I think we're going to find out, uh, without stealing her thunder. So uh, welcome, Naomi. It's really good to see you with us. Uh, and so I wonder, Naomi, yeah, I know you've chosen three songs, and you're going to, we'll come to those in due course, and you fitted your life around these three songs. So I wonder if you could, um, if you could take us from, from, from birth to wherever, adulthood, and to tell us you know, about your early days, where you were born, family life, all the, and the things that stand out for you in that first part of your life. Mm, okay. I was born in southern Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. Um, my, I was one of six children. I was number five. There were five girls and one brother. And um, my mother's name was Daisy. And my father's name was Arthur. And they were very sweet and kind. And my mum especially was a lovely, kind, gentle lady. My dad was born in um, Western Supermare, ah. and my mother was born in Zimbabwe. But my dad had strong Welsh roots because his father had travelled from Cardigan to South Africa to work on the boats that were laying undersea cables from wow. Cape Town to Cairo. I think it was probably a good venture for a young man, and you know, to earn some good money in those days. Sure. And uh, my mother's father had come from Surrey and had, was farming. So my mum was actually born on the farm and, um, well, they all were. And both had huge families. So I always say, I don't have a family, I have a tribe. <laughs> There's so many of us. So um, I grew up there in southern Rhodesia, I went to school. Um, we, my father was a devout Christian and he was a Plymouth Brethren. And none of us liked his church. My mum didn't like it. I didn't like it. My sisters didn't like it. For different reasons. It was very strict. And we didn't like wearing our school hats to Sunday school. That was just not on. But I felt, I think my mum found it quite sort of stern and a bit judgmental. And so our home life was very strict. We had a, a, a great um, childhood. But we weren't allowed music in the house and television and, you know, parties and, you know, we weren't allowed to go to the cinema. So it was quite strict and I didn't like it. And as I grew up, I be became a little bit rebellious because, you know, the Beatles had just landed on the, on the yeah. scene and, you know, I wanted to play music. And, but anyway, that's, that's how it was. But I noticed after my, my younger sister, Ruth, was born and growing up. My dad did mellow quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, so my childhood was very much into outdoor life. We were very privileged in, in Rhodesia. Um, I was always on my back or otherwise I was on the tennis court. Tennis was my first love. Wow. Um, sport was compulsory in our schools and I took part in most, but I didn't like hockey. But the rest of the things um, I enjoyed. And my mum also took up tennis. And so I used to play with her at her club on a Wednesday afternoon. And um, she was well known in the club for her fierce forehand and her practical jokes. She was always up to mischief and she made everybody laugh. And um, she loved her tennis. But if she had to play league, you know, on a Sunday, then she got into trouble with my father. He hated it. And he told her that when the Lord came to fetch his own, she would be left behind because she'd be on the tennis court. And I used to giggle at that. But, you know, it was quite cruel, really, to say that to my lovely mum. But anyway, things did, did mellow out and, you know, things changed a bit. So, And um, <clears throat> then... When I finished my O-levels, we, we had the British um, school system in, in Rhodesia. It was very, very British in those days. 
finished my O-levels. I would have loved to have gone on to A-levels, university. I wanted to be a teacher. And, um, but, you know, that was not an option in our family. You know, there were too many of us and there wasn't enough money. And it was also a case of, well, who do you think you are sort of thing, you know? So I had to comply. And um, I decided that very boldly one day I would go, because my mother said to me, you better start looking for a job. So I went along to Barclays Bank and marched in. No, very politely, actually. I didn't march politely. Asked for an application form and filled it in, got an interview, got the job. In those days, it was easy. You know, we're talking about the mid-60s. There were plenty of jobs for everybody. And then I asked the bank manager if he could um, organize my job to be in Botswana because my sister was living there with her family and she'd offered me a place to stay. Botswana was a neighboring country of um, Rhodesia and it was just becoming independent. So actually the day that I arrived there was the day of independence. It was in 1966. So it changed its name from Bechuana land, which was a British protectorate to the Republic of Botswana. There was a very, very proud time for the people there. And they were wonderful. And I liked it because they hadn't had apartheid. So the people were more confident and more relaxed. They hadn't faced the brutal racism of South Africa and Rhodesia. And when I was very young, I seemed to already have a social conscience because I worried about the poor people. And I didn't like the fact that the black people were treated differently. The children weren't allowed to partake in swimming pools and parks and they just weren't allowed to. They just had to keep to their, their areas and keep out the way. They weren't allowed in our schools or and in our churches, which I found incredible. And my dad could never actually give me an answer as to why black people weren't allowed in the church. So that was a very worrying thing for me. And I felt very sad and I used to get angry. And my mother used to get angry with me for what she said was being forward with black people. You know, I wasn't, you weren't supposed to talk to them and it was, it was horrible. Anyway, so Botswana, everything was a little more relaxed and um, and free. So you, I must, you're, you're into your late teens at this point. So yes. um, that might be a really good place to pick up on your first piece of music. And uh, what it says to you is, you, as the young Naomi enters adulthood and the world of work, the wonderful world of work, I wonder what piece of music uh, you've chosen? Well, I love Graham Kendrick. I love a lot of the modern um, Christian songs, and he's one of my favourites. And um, my, one of my favourite songs of his is um, God of the Poor. Mm -hmm. And I found it very touching and very moving. For brokenness, hope for despair. Lord, in the suffering, this is our prayer. Bread for the children, justice, joy, peace. Sunrise to sunset, your kingdom increase. Shelter for fragile lives, cure for their ills Work for the craftsmen, trade for their skills Land for the dispossessed, rights for the weak Voices to plead the cause of those who can't speak God of the poor 
It's a beautiful song name, isn't it? It's, uh, it, yes. it? The powerful words and the music complements it as well. It's just a very haunting, uh, moving yes. kind of song to listen to and sing. Mm, very, very moving. I normally cry when we sing it in church. <laughs> <laughs> so, Naomi Ruth, you've left us tantalizingly. Um, you, you, know, Bar- you talked about Barclays Bank, Botswana Land. You talked about... Uh, apartheid, growing up in a system of, um, of white privilege and being painfully aware of that injustice. So I wonder if you'd, you'd pick up the story and, uh, and take us further. Yes, well, uh, working in, in the bank in the, this little town was, um, it was very nice. I loved it. I loved 
work. I was always happy to to be there in the morning. I love being independent. Um, all the girls worked in Barclays Bank and all the boys worked in Standard Bank, which was on the other corner of the house street. <laughs> and the boys, the Standard Bank boys used to have um, like a social club. So they used to invite us for parties and dances. And we had a great time. We used to go water skiing. And it was there that I met my first husband. Um, mm. He worked for the Geological Survey Department. Wow. And um, he used to come into town now and again. He was mostly stationed out in the middle of nowhere doing his surveys. And um, I saw him in the bank and asked my colleagues who he was. Anyway, the bank manager knew him and invited us both to tea. They played um, Cupid. <laughs> and we were married a year or so later. And um, I was very ill, actually. Um, so I had to stay in Pretoria for quite a long time. I had pneumonia and I had E. coli and I had everything. It was awful. Anyway, um, I recovered and I was pregnant. And the baby, thanks to the Lord, was healthy and strong, my little David. And I went, you know, to join Dave in the caravan in the middle of nowhere. It was hard, though, with a, a new baby and, you know, being a um, not very experienced young mother. So I was pleased when we eventually got a house. Anyway, further down the line, Carol came along, my little girl, and everything was fine, but Dave was a very absent father. You know, he was he was a good man. He was older than me. He was very much an intellectual. And he was he was a lovely dad. He was a gentle dad. He had similar political views to me. He was a bit of a lefty at university. And um, eventually we, we parted ways and it was sad. And then I went and lived in Durban, um, which was lovely. And I worked there. And Jason used to go to a little nursery school called Wonderland and was run by a lovely Christian lady. And um, one afternoon when I went to fetch Jason, she said, we're having a prayer meeting here this evening. We meet every Thursday evening come and join us. I thought, oh, that's lovely. So I went along and we had a worship leader called Kim, who was a wonderful pianist and singer. And there were only about six of us. And we used to sing and praise the Lord and raise our arms and clap. And we, you know, it was all building up to the big um, Durban Christian Center then, okay. the big charismatic church. And um, one evening, um, the door suddenly opened slowly and this this old black man appeared and stood there and we were amazed because in those days black people were not allowed in white areas um, between six and six there was a curfew they'd be arrested chucked in the back of a police van and you know another cruel um, law of apartheid anyway we invited this old chap in and you could see he was he was really down and out he had a tatty old coat on and, you know, he obviously hadn't had a, any sort of wash for a long, long time. And we said, come in and join us. And he sat between my friend and I and we held his hands and we stood up and sang and he lifted his arms. Oh, it was so beautiful. He didn't know the words, but he just rejoiced with us. Yeah. And I remember the feel of his hand. It was so rough. And... um we were amazed at, at this man, but he just disappeared afterwards. We wanted to ask who he was and, you know, see if we could help him in some way. And by the time we looked, he had gone. We went out and looked up and down the street and there was no sign of him. Yeah. And I yeah. often think about that old man and I wonder, he probably heard us singing from, you know, from the street. Or maybe he'd even been sleeping in the grounds, I don't know. But we were so blessed to have him come in there that night. And he never came again. Yeah, what a great story. Well, we loved Durban because, you know, we were at the sea and the children loved it. And, um, and I was very involved in my career then. I was working for a company that, that was supplying dental equipment to dental laboratories, including gold. So I used to travel around then with them. 
And um, then they transferred me after many years, actually, they transferred me to Johannesburg, their head office, and then from Johannesburg to go and build up the market in a town called Port Elizabeth, which was in the Eastern Cape. Um, I was very reluctant to go. You know, I didn't want to uproot the children again. But anyway, we did. We moved. And um, it it was tough there. It was in the 80s, mid-80s. And the situation in South Africa was volatile, you know, politically. You could feel it almost in the air that there was something bad brewing. People had had enough. There'd been riots and all sorts. And it was there that I joined um, um, a human rights organization called the Black Sash. It was mostly run, well, it was mostly women who ran it. It was an old organization, and it had, had been started by a group of housewives in Johannesburg who protested to the government against um, uh, only the whites being allowed to vote. So they were famous for standing in the street with their black sash and holding a placard, you know, very peacefully. Our generation, we were a little more active, although we never broke the rules. And if we did go on the streets and protest, we used to get the appropriate permission. We had to show our posters to the authorities because we couldn't, you know, put anything on there that wouldn't cite violence. And we used to protest in the street. and. The most important thing, I think, was that we had advice officers in the, in the main centres of South Africa where people could come and ask for advice, for help. And because it was a terrible time, we went from one state of emergency to the other. And, um, you know, people, it, it just gave the powers that be a carte blanche to arrest, to detain to lock people up. Nelson Mandela was still locked up, of course, as were most of the, the main ANC leaders. And um, so I used to go and work in the advice office two mornings a week, scruffy little office. We just had some rickety desks, pencil and notepad, and these people used to come pouring in. They used to arrive early in the morning. They would have walked from the township because they couldn't afford bus fare. It was, it was so bad. People were so poor. The poverty level was indescribable. And, um, you know, we, had, we used to sit and take notes from these people as to whatever their needs were. Unfed, dismissal, assault. Members of their family had been detained in the night. The police had come, smashed the door down, taken people out. Children were, were taken, abducted, killed. It was horrendous, really horrendous. And there's the special branch, the police, they were our enemy. And they hated us with a passion. They used to call us all sorts of names. And um, we knew them because, you know, by sight, because they used to hang around um, outside our building to see who was coming in and who they could arrest, you know, and who. They were always on the lookout. They were they were horrible. Mm -hmm. And um, one interesting thing that happened there was um, uh, one of the ladies asked me one day if I wouldn't mind helping out um, this um, human rights lawyer. She had her own practice very close to our office, and she just needed someone to answer the phone while she was in court. I said, "Yes, yeah, sure, I'll do that." And I went and sat in her office and phone didn't ring so I just sat there and it looked perfectly legitimate and everything and years and years later down the line I found out that she was a spy for the South African government there were quite a few and um, her boyfriend was one of these special branch policemen who used to hang out on the on the street outside our office so you know she worked Quite closely to us, so she got quite a bit of information out of us. Mm. We uncovered a couple of moles. It was it was almost like James Bond sometimes. <laughs> but um, on a serious note, it was it was so so difficult and scary. 
my children knew not not ever to talk about it, you know, to their friends or at school, um, because I was scared. You know, they they knew exactly who who we were, and they were just waiting for us to, you know, to trip up. Mm. So, um, yeah, nasty. It must have been hard <laughs> to know who to trust, Naomi Ruth. I'd imagine at uh, at that time. It was well. I didn't speak to any of my friends about it. And my family didn't know what what was going on. They didn't know because, um, you know, if, if they ever got wind of it, well, I remember my mother once saying to me something about she'd heard something and she said to me, are you a communist? <laughs> and I said, no, mum. I said, do you know what a communist is? And oh, clearly she didn't. And I said, no, I'm not a communist. I, I just care about people. So, but it, they were dangerous times, they were horrible times. And, um, you know, it was just joyful when Nelson Mandela was eventually released. Not only joyful, but absolutely necessary because we were on the brink. Yeah. And yeah. I can't even begin to think what it would have been like had, had it gone on. You mentioned Neo, uh, Nelson Mandela there, Naomi. So I'm, I'm trying. I'm casting my mind back. I'm going to say that was in the early 90s. Yes, well, he, yes, he was released, if, if I'm correct, I think in 1990. Hmm. So I'm talking about the eight, from the mid-80s to the end 80s, when I was with, in Port Elizabeth and with the Black Sash. And then things gradually started to change. Do you know that we were never allowed to see pictures of Nelson Mandela? Really? It was forbidden. You, if you had a picture of Nelson Mandela and somebody reported you, you would be arrested because of the state yeah. of emergency. We weren't allowed to mention his name. Um, <laughs> sometimes we used to talk in code in, in the office. Sounds dramatic, but we had to be careful because you never knew who was listening. Yeah, wow. Yeah. No, Extraordinary. So he goes, so he went from being most wanted man in South Africa, pretty much, to president within uh, a matter of years. Yes, well, he was, he was called a terrorist and a dangerous man. Um, he never used violence. He tried everything. He tried dialect, um, you know, to change, to give an equal opportunity to the majority. Um, but he was, he was called a terrorist, and people believed that he was violent. There was there was a situation with a I think a railway line being blown up at one stage. He didn't obviously didn't do it himself, but it was within around the time that he was still free. Hmm. So yes. So so where were you in 1990 then, Naomi? Were you still living in South Africa, or had yes. you moved on? I was still I was still in South Africa. Was it 19? Yes, it was 1990. I'd gone back to Johannesburg then. Hmm. So again, you know, another move. I'm an expert at packing boxes, by the way. <laughs> so I remember the day clearly, actually, because, um, you know, it was all over the news that Mandela was being released and we, everyone was excited. A lot of people were terrified. They said the streets were going to be gushing with blood and there was going to be murder and mayhem. It was nothing of the sort. No. And... Um, I sat in my house in Johannesburg with the television on and the newsreader, the guy who was covering it, was so uncomfortable because he was clearly from the other side and wasn't keen on this job at all. And, um, you know, they had all the sort of build up and you saw Winnie Mandela because he wasn't released directly out of Robben Island. He was actually in a house mm -hmm. in Cape Town. And when he had been there to see him, she was allowed visits to him once a month when he was on the island. But she'd obviously been seeing more of him in, in this house. It was all very hush hush. Yeah. Anyway, suddenly he appeared and I couldn't look. I was so overcome with emotion. I put my head down and I couldn't look. I didn't trust myself to look at his face. And then eventually I, I looked 
Doctor Neri was walking with that wonderful big smile of his, with Winnie in tow, tall and proud, and just that wonderful man. And the people went crazy, as you can imagine. Yeah, yeah, what a wonderful time. Yeah, it was really amazing. So, what else was happening in your life at that point, Naomi? Naomi, because I'm wondering if this is going to take us into into your second song as well. Yes, well, at that point, I was about to um, to get married again, and we were going to Nigeria because my my husband was um, was German, working for a German company. I had worked for them as well previously, and they transferred him to Lagos in Nigeria. So we were on the brink of leaving. We got married in 1991, and then left for Nigeria. But it will probably be a good time to play the song that I chose because I'll tell you a little bit about the singer. Um, mm -hmm. His name is Johnny Clegg. Very sadly, he passed away last year from cancer. Heartbreaking for the whole of Southern Africa as well as many European countries because we adored him. He, was, mm -hmm. he built bridges between black and white whether you were a musician or not, he was a simply wonderful young man. And he had a fascination to learn how to play the guitar the way the black people did, because apparently they used a different technique or something. And he studied the music from the time he was young in Johannesburg. And then he formed a band and he toured everywhere. And in France, he was known as the White Zulu because he could also dance. Wow. You know, traditional dancing with, with the Zulus. What a guy. He's simply a wonderful man. And he's left such a fabulous legacy of music for all of us who love Africa. Mm -hmm. So this particular track, he was, um, it was a concert in 1999 in Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. And he was singing a song called Asim Bonana. And it means we haven't seen him. And it was a song that he wrote in the 80s. Um, he, will, he will explain it um, about the fact that we hadn't seen Mandela. We weren't allowed to see him. But, you know, he was always with us, basically. 13 years ago, in 1986, South Africa was in a state of emergency. And um, there was a very intense cultural struggle that was being waged. And we were part of that, and this is a song that we wrote for a truly one of the greatest South Africans um, in history, Nelson Mandela. And we'd like to open the show tonight with a tribute to him. Thank you. 
Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. It is a music <clears throat> and dancing that makes me at peace with the world. <laughs> and, and at peace with myself. But I don't see much movement at the back there, you know? <coughs> I would like us to join. Let's just repeat. Let's just repeat it. as well. So mm -hmm. let's, let's pick up the story again. Um, you've again, uh, the international theme, uh, very apparent. Uh, we were on the verge, I think, of moving to Lagos, yes. Nigeria. Uh, yes. And on the verge of getting married. Uh, yes. So yeah, tell, tell us what, what happened next. So we got married at the end of 91 in Johannesburg and off we went to Lagos. My children were grown up. I was terribly sad to leave them behind, to leave my country, my job, my career, friends and everything. And going to a place that I'd only heard bad things about, I knew it was going to be a challenge. Um, Job-wise, it was great for my new husband, so off we went. And it was traumatic from the minute we, we landed in, in Lagos, really traumatic. You know, I'd never experienced such um, harassment or corruption before in any way. But, you know, we got through it. And I'm glad I had three and a half years there because it was a, an education in itself, meeting different people. The Nigerians are amazing people. They are tough. They are brilliant businessmen. They will sell you the shoes on your feet. They are so good. Um, <laughs> And then from Lagos, uh, we made a lot of friends in Lagos. And then we moved on to Ghana because in Lagos, we basically just came to a stop because there were, there were three coups when we were there, military coups, and um, there was a massive fuel shortage. So when we eventually got down to the sort of bottom, bottom of the barrel of diesel and we couldn't run the generators anymore, because there was ne never any electricity. Um, our head office in Frankfurt said, no, it's time to shut it down. So we closed the office and it was terribly sad, you know, saying goodbye to our staff. I found them all jobs, really good jobs. And then off we went to, to Accra in Ghana. Wow. And that was so different. It was only up, up the coast. People were friendly, relaxed, easygoing. It was lovely. 
and we were there for another three years. And then um, we were uh, transferred back to Frankfurt. Well, it was my husband's home. So in all that time, I used to fly home to see my family and my children. Mm. And one of the nice things was we did a lot of traveling because we used to get these free flights back. And so we used to travel around a lot. So anyway, we went back to Germany. and. Um, um, my husband had inherited his father's house, very, very old house, beautiful old house, and we renovated it. We lived there and was simply stunning. It was really a lovely life. Mm. I was lonely, though. Um, the people in the village accepted me after a while, and they were friendly, but it was never the same. It was, I always felt that I was the outsider. Mm. I learned to speak German as well as I could, but. I was very lonely. Anyway, then things started going terribly wrong and um, my husband wasn't happy in his job and we were transferred to Montreal and I thought, well, this is great. This is a new start and I love Quebec. It was simply beautiful, but no, it didn't work. And he, he told me it was best that, that I left. So that was when I came to Cardiff. Uh, uh, right. I didn't know where to go. I didn't have a home. I was 56. I was, I hadn't worked for 15 years. And I was pretty, pretty much broken. Mm. So, and my young son was here. My daughter in London offered me, a, you know, to go there, but I didn't want to go to London. I came to Cardiff. Jason helped me an awful lot, bless his heart. and. Um, and then, so he said, Mum, just just come here for a while and see what you want to do next. I, I didn't know. For the first time in my life, I really didn't know what to do. So anyway, I decided to stay in Cardiff. So I looked for a job and, you know, to sort out a whole lot of sort of legal stuff and everything. And... What I didn't tell you about my early life was when I was 13, I went to a Billy Graham rally. Mm. It was beautiful. It was outdoors, and I went with my mum and my friend, and I gave my life to Jesus that night. Right, yeah. And then, you know, I went on this rocky old road in between. So when I came to Cardiff, um, there were lots of moments of despair. and. Mm -hmm. I started thinking, you know, God, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if you're there, if you're real. I don't know what to do. And my daughter always said to me, Mom, you will look back at this time and you will realize that it's all happened for the best. No matter how heartbroken you are, you will realize mm. that. Mm. And, um, and God definitely did have a big hand in my life. I was living in, in a flat in the village and I got a new neighbor mm -hmm. and it was David Clark. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And of course we spoke about Ararat and I always used to walk past the church and I always used to look in and I, you know, I would have loved to have just walked in, but I didn't feel confident enough. Anyway, David assured me that I would be welcome. And mm -hmm. one Easter Sunday I, I went walked in and loved it immediately it was like home hmm. and, um, because the churches i'd been to previously were the big charismatic loud and i didn't like it that wasn't for me hmm. um anyway so i loved ararat and um i loved the people and i was baptized a year later wow so, yeah it was really, really special. So I knew that, and I said at my baptism, I had let go of God, of his hand, but he'd never let go of mine. Fabulous. Yeah. They brought me all the way through to where, where I am today. Bless your name. Well, look, let's, let's get to your final song then. Before I, I'm going to put a little question to you after this song, but I wonder if you could introduce 
your final song to us, please. Yes, okay. well, my final song means it's a hymn, and it means so much to me because um, during the sort of difficult times and hard times in Durban, when it was just me and the children, whenever I used to go and visit my family, they used to ask my children to sing. Because David and Carol especially used to sing really beautifully. Mm-hmm. And they used to love singing this hymn. And I can still hear their sweet voices and hitting the high notes <laughs> before David's voice broke. And it's, um, um, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. It's a hymn I love to sing as a chorister, I think, purely because of the beautiful melody. But as I've got older, I really appreciate the sentiment more than ever that no matter how busy and hectic our modern lives are, God's voice can still cut through and speak to us in a calm and tranquil way. It's a wonderful hymn, and uh, in many ways, it, it pulls together so many threads uh, in your own life, not just your personal life, but um, I, I guess the, the international, um, the, you know, the epic journeys you've undertaken and the things you've seen mm-hmm. in your life, and some of the foolish, deeply foolish and cruel things that people are capable of inflicting on each other, and in need of God's mercy. So thank you for that. Before we go, Naomi Ruth, I've asked everybody else so far um, to what would happen in your particular instance if uh, Naomi today bumped into uh, maybe maybe back in, back in Rhodesia, as it would have been back in those days, uh, as an eight, your old eight-year-old self, what would you, would you have any words of advice? What would you say to yourself? All those, if you could. I would have so many words of advice, given. <laughs> Firstly, I would say, don't be afraid to stand up for what you believe in. Um, you know, be confident. And always rule with your head before you rule with your heart. That's a big piece of wisdom, Naomi. <laughs> big Taking piece a of long wisdom. time. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> it resonates with me and I'm sure it'll resonate with everybody who's watching this as well. Naomi, thank you so much. It's been wonderful listening to you and uh, thank you for being so open, giving us your three, your, you know, three wonderful pieces of music and 
giving us an insight into your life as well. Many, many thanks. God well, bless. Thank, thank you, Gerton. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.